Until Dawn continues on Channel 5 with Creature from Black Lake. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating and always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFelita, and I'm the show's Toastmaster General. Well, welcome back to part two of my conversation with Mel Brooks, who clearly needs no introduction, except maybe you need an introduction if, in case you haven't heard part one of this conversation. Uh, because in part one of the conversation, I begin by explaining to you how I know Mel and how this conversation came to be. So if, in fact, you're listening to part two and you're wondering this, go back. Don't listen to this. Go back to part one. I'll explain the whole thing. Listen to part one and then come back to part two. And if, if that's not the case and you're, you've already heard part one, ignore the first 30 seconds of this intro. Um, this is uh, Mel talking about, uh, a lot of, talking about World War II. And it's a, it's a different Mel uh, than you're used to. It's a ruminative and um, reflective man who's talking about stuff that happened to him a long time ago when he was Mel Kaminsky. Uh, a young guy from Brooklyn who found himself overseas uh, fighting a world war. Um, it's interesting to hear the uh, the non showbiz Mel, you know, and and uh, but don't but don't worry. We also hear the showbiz Mel. We start talking after a while about Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein and Silent Movie uh, and Johnny Carson. We, we 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 get to him too. So anyway, enjoy part two of my conversation with the legendary Mel Brooks. been born six months early I probably wouldn't we wouldn't have be having this conversation because uh, the Battle of the Bulge had 106 I think infantry division or something like that. anyway there were a bunch of newcomers and they shoved they shoved them somewhere near Bastogne and a lot, a lot of those guys were killed or captured so you know and and they were only six months to a year older than I was and uh, I, uh, when I was only um, 17 in 1944, a guy came to Eastern District High School in Brooklyn, and he, he was a major in the Army, and he told us about this thing, the Army Specialized Training Reserve Program, and he said, if you join that, we will, you know, uh, accelerate your graduation so that you know you won't you won't do a whole year of graduation. You'll you'll be graduated automatically from your high school, and we will send you to a college where you can do something that you know so that later when you're 18 and actually legally in the army, uh, you'll have some some training and 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 some uh, academic specialty that maybe the army could use. So I I took the test to get into the army specialized training, res, you know, reserve reserve army reserve program, 
Of course it was, they wanted you. So it was, you know, uh, who was our first president? I mean, it was just, it was uh, amazingly primitive and simple, you know. Right. You know, and uh, on one one of the tests, it was one and one, and I said, side by side, there are 11. I put that in my test, you know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we- I, and they still took me, and I was, now at, at 17, I was in the Army Specialized Training Reserve Program. I was in, so was Carl Reiner, by the way. Carl Reiner went to Georgetown University in Washington, and uh, he studied, his, his, his specialty was French, so that he could help the Army, you know, you know being, and, and he was, graduated from Georgetown in French. Of course, the minute he was graduated, being a French scholar, you know, French language expert anyway, he was sent right to Hawaii. So that's the honor. <laughs> yeah. You spend a year learning, you know, studying French, and they send you to Hawaii. You know. Anyway, I studied chemical uh, engineering. It's, it has to do with cosines, with tangents, with slide rules. I, I, I don't know how I learned it. I learned it, and I said, this is good. It will probably keep me out of the infantry when I go into the Army because I'll be, you know, an electrical engineer. You know, maybe I'll even, you know, get a, get a, a, a post somewhere around Washington or something. Anyway, hoping for the best. And uh, later... They sent me to Virginia Military Institute, VMI, and and it was really a great, uh, terrific. I had never been I, the only place I'd ever been outside of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, was in Camp Sussex, New Jersey. We welcome you to Sussex Camp. We're mighty glad you're here. We'll send the air reverberating with a mighty cheer, rah, rah. We'll sing you in, we'll sing you out with all our praises. We will shout, hail, hail, the gang's all here, and you're welcome to Sussex Camp. So, I mean, I was very, very happy. <laughs> to be, uh, I take it that's not a, a Mel Brooks song, though. No, no, but it uh, it got me thinking about songwriting. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was, it was so much... You know, I, I remember when I went to Sussex Camp, I'll get right back to the Army in a minute. I went to Sussex Camp, and uh, and our counselors were called uncles. And so there was Uncle Tim, uh, Uncle uh, Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe was a favorite of mine. And, and, and I was puzzled. I remember saying to Uncle Joe, where are the candy stores? Where's the drugstore? Where, where, where are the buildings? He said, well, this is the country. It's, you know, it's a... I said, yeah, but somewhere there's got to be a building with a backyard with laundry, you know. I mean, there's got to be. I said, there's nothing here. It's just I don't I don't understand. He says, well, it, it, it's called the country, and uh, and it, it features mostly grass and trees. I said, well, why do they need that? <laughs> you know, I remember. I remember this. This conversation, I couldn't get a good answer out of Uncle Joe because I thought every time I I looked around a tree, I would see, I would see a corner candy store, or something that that was civilization. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't <laughs> believe there was such a thing as as, as country as as open. Anyway, uh, yeah. Anyway, Sussex Camp was fun. I finished it via VMI, which was a wonderful experience. The only thing is that we, we went into Lexington, Virginia, which is the, the little town where where VMI is, you know, in the same vicinity. And I never understood the waitress, and I always said no thanks because I didn't know what she was she was asking. We would we'd order whatever we had, you know, bacon and eggs, or you know, just stuff, you know scrambled eggs or pancakes, whatever. And she'd always say, the waitress would always say, you want grits or that? And I, the first couple of times I said, what? 
and she repeated, you want grits of that? And then I knew by her tone she was asking something. And I said, no, thanks. You know, fine. And so she was on her way. And uh, every time, weekends, we were off, and we'd, we'd go into Lexington, and we'd have, you know, some fun, and we'd go to a dance. Or we'd, but we'd always have breakfast, and there was always a waitress who said, you want Chris or that? And one day, I just had the nerve to say, could you please say that very slowly, what you just said? She said, I just said, you want grits with that? And I, I, it was grits, whatever grits were. I guess they're corn grits, you know. Uh, you want grits with that? So I you didn't know. You didn't know from grits. I didn't know from grits in Brooklyn. We never, had, we never had grits. <laughs> but BMI was good, you know. It was, it was. It taught me a lot about. I don't know. I mean, they were these these young men at VMI, these young cadets that we joined. They were they were gallant kids. I mean, and, you know, and they were, and they were honest and true. And you know, it was it was a really a good experience for me. Uh, I, I loved being uh, an army uh, in the army reserve, and they welcomed us as fellow cadets it was just really they were very really kind and you know great experience so yeah. anyway i'm in the army um i they send me i've studied electrical engineering you know for a semester at least i'm in the army and they they, they classify me <laughs> they, they said, okay, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And I said, Fort Sill, what, what, you know, what, what, what is that? What is it? It's an infantry. Uh, no, I said, I said, is it an infantry? I just, the one thing I was afraid of was just being a, a slogging a foot soldier. I wanted to do more than that. And they said, no, it's the field artillery. Oh, my God. I studied electrical engineering. What am I going to do in the field artillery? I said to him. He said, you'll pull a lanyard and you'll send a big shell hurtling towards the enemy. I said, okay, I'll do my best, you know. And funny story, okay, story upon story. Stay with me, okay? I'm, as always. <laughs> I'm, I'm directing, I, I've signed... I'll tell you that story later about Joseph E. Levine and how I got the job of directing the producers. Anyway, I'm going to be the director. They send me to a place to be examined for insurance. You've got to have insurance because if the director can't direct, then you, the company gets its money back or something. Or they, so the nurse who, who examines me, Every, she said, I said, oh, she said, tip tap, you're fine. There's just one thing. I have to ask you a very big question. Uh, I said, sure, anything. She said, tell me, did you have jaundice, yellow jaundice, as a child? I said, no, I, I don't remember having, I don't remember having yellow jaundice. She said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I never had yellow jaundice. She said, well, upon examining you, I, I looked in your, you know, your inner ears, and they're actually bright yellow. The in, your inner ear, just leading to the outside, is, is, is very yellow. It's bright yellow, and that would lead me to conclude that you had yellow jaundice, and you, you were left with that. I said, oh, no, that wasn't yellow jaundice. That was camels, camel cigarettes. So she, thought, <laughs> she, looked at me, she looked at me like, uh, I'm not going to write, you know, physically perfect, mentally questionable, you know. You know? <laughs> I said, that was camel cigarettes. She said, okay, okay, how come, you know, why? And I said, I was, I was, uh, you know, in, in the field artillery 
for basic training. And the field artillery is composed of a lot of guys and a lot of cannons. And the cannons make a lot of noise when, when they go off. And a sergeant, who was an old sergeant in the artillery, said, don't use the, what the Army gives you for, for you know, ear, little ear, ear stop, or whatever. He said, take a cigarette, get rid of the uh, first uh, bunch, bunch of tobacco, spin the, spin the paper closed, lick it closed, and shove the cigarettes in your ear with, with the paper covering the tobacco. Said, and that is perfect for keeping the sound out of your head. So, and I did that, and it was good. And I, I never had, you know, hearing troubles because I shoved, a, I was smoking camels at the time, camel cigarettes in, in my ears. So, uh, in in a in a sense, then camel cigarettes saved your career, because if you had yellow jaundice, you might have not gotten insured. Never gotten insured. Camel cigarettes saved my career. Every week in the year, the camel people send gift cigarettes to servicemen's and veterans' hospitals. This week, camels go to veterans' hospitals Coatesville, Pennsylvania, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. United States Army Oliver General Hospital, Augusta, Georgia, and the United States Naval Hospital, Charleston, South Carolina. The camel people have now sent more than 190 million free camels to servicemen, servicewomen, and veterans. Also, I have perfect pitch. Not everybody has perfect pitch. I write songs. And in order to write songs, you've got to really be in tune, and you've got to really know your notes. And you really have to have perfect pitch. And so camels saved me, saved my songwriting career. <laughs> so anyway, that was the, that was the army. Anyway, the guns. They, you know, I I was going to be actually. I worked my way into being a radio operator in the artillery. That's being a forward observer or something. So I wouldn't be right next to the cannon all the time. You know, because when you pull that lanyard, that's a big big blast it, it just drives you crazy if you had to do it you know you, sure. you see uh world war ii pictures of these artillery guys and they're shoving in one five five millimeter shells and blasting one and blasting another and bla i mean it's amazing with with the you know the the uh how many shells they, they can get into a cannon in, in a minute you know and uh, <clears throat> anyway uh, I get on the boat, the boat, you can't say the boat, you have to say the ship. I get on a ship, troop ship, Brooklyn Navy Yard, sometime in February. And uh, I'm only 18, 18. And, uh, and they have these cots, one stacked above the other, like six. And... And you, you know, you grab one of them. You don't. You, you 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 fight for the one on the top, because then you don't have. You're not between people. Anyway, the the troop ship took something. I don't know. I think we we got on the. It's February third or fourth, nineteen forty-four, and we are. Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we leave. We leave about midnight, and we're, two or three hours later. It's, I, I just want to die. It, the ship goes way up, way down, way to the side, way to the other side. And, and, and half the guys start, you know, they can't hold, hold their stuff. And they're, they're throwing up, whooping, throwing, really throwing up. I mean, I, go, oh. I, I went on deck, one of the merchant marine guys, I had a $50 bill. I said, here, help me get under one of these lifeboats on deck. He said, it's going to be very cold. And he said, when we get, we're going into the North Atlantic. And it's February. I said, I don't give a shit. Get me, you know, I, I had my, 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 I don't know what, something to, to 
crawl into to sleep. And I and he he said, okay. He took the 50 bucks. He got me some blankets and a big tarp to cover all the blankets. And I, for the rest of the voyage, which was like 16 or 17 days, every night, you know, I would somehow make my way on deck. I'd find my lifeboat. I'd, I'd, I'd get into my sleeping bag underneath it. And I had this uh, this, this guy, Vincent, I think his name was Vinny. And he would he would uh, cover me with this incredible tarp so that there was a lot of ocean, cold, bitter cold ocean spray, but it didn't get to me. But it was so yeah. much better than being in the vomitarium. <laughs> it was just the worst. But I did write a, I wrote a, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had a column during those years, and it was called uh, My Day. So I wrote, I wrote one called My Floating Day. And it was, it was kind of funny about, about growing up in crap games and whatever it was. For many reasons, three of them will do. It's 1815. I am French, and this is Waterloo. <laughs> Warm, soldiers of France, lift up your lamps, pick up your pants, the battle's begun. <laughs> to arms, here's a goal, this is no stall, get on the ball, the battle's begun. The enemy's advancing, with murder in his eye, our way I think he's glancing, for us it's do or die. I don't mind the do part. <laughs> Listen, folks, I have a very good idea. Shoot, shoot, drop a suit, run. The foe is near, our choice is clear. Get out of here, hooray for fear, we're done. Run away, run away. If you run away, you live to run away another day. Give your feet a chance. I've got the news for all of you. They got to lose, so move your shoes to France. Face defeat. Be discreet. If you got brains, you'll keep that blood in the vein. <laughs> Show me a horse, and I'll disappear. <laughs> Who loves the smell of a fight? Right. Show me the man who scorns the coward in flight. Show me a man who loves a feel of steel in his gut. Show me that man, I'll show you a nut. <laughs> Here they come, they're breaking through. What do we do? What do we do? Retreat, retreat, give your feet a chance. I got the news for all of you. They gotta lose some move for friends. Face defeat, be in the street. This is it. Time to quit. Back to feet. And retreat. When we landed, I got on the truck. And we drove all night, and early in the morning, we we land we we arrived at a little farm in Normandy called Montrepo. So it's a pretty funny for a funny name, a French name yeah. Montrepo, meaning yeah. You you know Montrepo, you know, stuff like that is reserved for a grand chateau somewhere. You know, it's your repose, your. <laughs> Your, your little vacation home, you know. Yeah, right. And, and this was a little, just a hard-working farm that made, uh, actually, that made made a lot of uh, charcuterie, you know. That, but, you know, ham and bologna. And, and they, hard-working little farm. Mont right. Okay. We go to Mont Repo, and I get a real bed in, a, in the farmhouse. You know, with the... Uh, with another soldier across the way. And I said, hey, my guy's name was Charlie. I'll never forget. He, as as we were driving, this guy, Charlie, we buddied up. He, he, he was from New Jersey, from Hoboken, I think. And he kept saying to me, he kept saying, no, no. I said, what? He said, I can't take it. I said, what do you mean? He said, I can't, I can't, I can't. Look at another sign. He said, I don't know what these, I, these signs are driving me crazy. Patisserie Blanche, Blanchisserie, 
uh, you know, everything. <laughs> he said, every, you know, everything. I don't understand any. I said, well, you better have your nervous breakdown because every, every we're in France, Charlie, and a lot of the signs are going to be in French. <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> anyway, he's, I helped him get through that nervous breakdown. There was a little kid who loved me. He called me Private Mel, and he and he had a tricycle, and he went 100 miles an hour on that little tricycle. I was zipping around me. I was just afraid he'd kill me. And uh, uh, I think uh, I think his name was uh, Levasseur was the family of the farm, you know. I th- and I think he was Pierre, Pierre Levasseur, a little Pierre. So he drove around. He drove around. And we became buddies, and you know, and I was making a movie uh, for Brooks Films for, for my company uh, called, of course, you know, it, The Elephant Man. Mm-hmm. And uh, Christopher DeVore and Charles Bergeron uh, were the writers of The Elephant Man, and we uh, we, uh, we we went from a location on somewhere on the right bank of the Thames, I've got a meat market, to indoors at Shepparton. We're going to be set up there. It was going to take about 10 days to leave that one location and get it, you know. So I, I don't know, I had a brilliant idea. And I said to uh, Ber- Berggren and DeVore, the writers, I said, uh, how would you guys like to see where I was stationed in Normandy. And he said, I'm sure. And then I said, then we'll go to Paris and whoop it up. So I uh, I took them, you know, from, I, in those days, I think, yeah, I think we went on a, on a ferry and then we went, uh, we landed, we went on a train and then from the train, uh, we landed at a place, Rouen, which is in, in Normandy. We hired a car, and we uh, we we got a driver, and we went to this little town called Saint Aubin sur Sea, which is where Mont Repos, the farm, had. I took them there, and uh, there was this. It hadn't changed. It's the same little farmhouse. I pointed to uh, the, the window uh, on the second floor that I had stayed in you know, with Charlie, with my buddy. And uh, but when I got there, I knocked on the door, and uh, you know the door opened. It was this burly, big burly guy with a black beard. You know, qu'est-ce que vous voulez? You know, what do you want? I said, je suis, uh, je suis un soldat pendant la guerre ici. Uh, he stopped and he looked. For a whole minute, he stopped and he looked. And he said, Private Mel! <laughs> I couldn't believe it. We both started. Wow. Well. Amazing. Yeah! Huh. <laughs> this little tiny kid in a little tricycle. And he was, you know. And he was, I said, Pierre! Yeah. I couldn't believe it. You know. It was, a, it was just a great, it's a great story, and I thought you should. He's, and that's what, four, 30 years, 35 years later? Yeah, it was about, yeah, 25, 30 years later, whatever, it's 35 years Wow. Later. And then he, you know, and then he fed it us with uh, great cheeses and and uh, salamis and, and good fr- French country bread and, and wine, and I was just amazed, it was just it was How wonderful! A great, great afternoon. I, I I asked my father once how he got through the war, and he said I got through it by never expecting to get through it. He said so I wasn't I wasn't really scared. Does that make sense to you? I, yeah, I think he's right. I think I I kind of thought we were in a newsreel. <laughs> I didn't I didn't really think. I always thought you know I've always been, was treated right. I was the baby of the family. I, you know, I was, 
and on my block I was the comic, everybody loved me. So I thought, you know, things will always go my way, you know. Right. I didn't, I didn't, you know, once in a while if you heard a lot of noise, you got scared. Torn from the fiery pages of the mightiest annals of the West comes the supreme saga in the great tradition of frontier drama. Francis. I had no idea that Blazing Saddles would be a big hit. Mm. I never, I never went the, uh, the the correct route to make money. The correct route to make money is to get two big stars to begin with. So at least you have a big opening week, you know. And. Uh, you know, I mean, talk about blazing saddles. Nobody knew who Cleavon Little was. This beautiful, handsome Broadway actor, you know, black, black, uh, handsome, pr brilliant actor. And, I mean, I didn't have any, you know, there was Gene Wilder, who had begun to make a little bit of a stir but he still wasn't a big star. He became a big star with Richard Pryor. Right. But he wasn't. I mean, and then Harvey Corman was only known maybe on the Carol Burnett show. And I mean, I really... And Madeline Kahn was known for the producers. And yeah. I mean, I'd never had, I never had any stars. The first real star that I ever worked with was at the end of my career. I did in, in Dracula, Dead and Living, and I had Leslie Nielsen, who was a big star. <laughs> but I never had any stars. I mean, and I uh, guess, and I guess, when you look back on a on a movie that's a phenomenon like Blazing Saddles was, it, it's easy to say like, oh, this is where you can put it, but. The truth is, you've got Count Basie's orchestra out in the the middle of the, you know. So there's nothing normal about that any more than there's anything safe about making Young Frankenstein in black and white, for instance. You know what I liked about uh, Blazing Saddles? I wrote a lot of dialogue. I decided to write, for instance, the the sheriff. The black sheriff and the Waco kid, Gene Wilder and Cleveland Little, are sitting together in the in in the jailhouse. And the Waco kid says to the black sheriff, I mean, what a what a spate of title. Like, I don't know where I got it from. The Waco kid says to the black sheriff, Tell me, what's a dazzling urbanite like you doing in a provincial setting like this? I mean <laughs> That, that is such crazy dialogue for a Western, you know? Right, uh, right. You know? It, it's really insane dialogue. And another one that I wrote that I'm very proud of is Cleavon walks up and down the street his first day as sheriff. A little old lady in a bonnet walks past him and as she walks past. He says, good morning, ma'am, and isn't it a lovely morning? And she says, up yours. <laughs> you see, that I cut to him coming into the, back into his office, the sheriff, into the jail. And he's, yeah. he's, there are tears. He's really, you see, he's, his eyes are tearing. You know, he's, he's actually crying. And Gene puts his arm around him and says, there, you know, you can't blame me. I mean, these people. These are simple pioneers. People of the land. Right. You know, people, you know, these are uh, people of the land. The true grit of the New West. You know, morons. You know. <laughs> That's one of the big slaps I ever got. You know. And, 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 and takes uh, Cleveland, you know, takes the black sheriff out of his uh, doldrums and out of his, you know, he breaks him into a big laugh. So. It's coming from the deep 
dark recesses of the mind of Mel Brooks. I love him. Young Frankenstein. Guy means business. Ah! Young Frankenstein. Oh dear, nothing left. What shall we throw in now? Starring Gene Wilder as Dr. Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein. But what about your grandfather's work, sir? My grandfather's work was doo-doo! Peter Boyle as the monster. Young Frankenstein was a big hit. To begin with, goes out a great title, and then we lived up to the title with a great picture. Yeah. But still didn't have any stars. Peter Boyle and Gene Wilder, you know. Right. No stars. Of course, Leachman, you know. I mean, amazing, yeah. amazing the money I made without stars. Now, that brain that you gave me, was it Hans Delbrooks? No. Ah. Good. Uh, would you mind telling me whose brain I did put in? And you won't be angry? I will not be angry. Abby someone. Abby someone. Abby who? Abby normal. Abby... Normal. I'm almost sure that was the name. <laughs> Are you saying that I put an abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long, 54 inch wide gorilla? What? Is that what you're telling me? Wait. Get What? Three syllables, yes. Marty Feldman was so wonderful. Squeezed into that little yellow Morgan. Yeah. Yeah. What was, what was Marty Feldman like? I've never heard anything about him. Uh, he, was, he was a little... I, he was very talented. I mean, the camera loved him, loved his face. You know, I said you could... He had this. He had a condition where his eyes uh, looked out to the side. You know, I mean, they they just were they were bulging, and they looked one looked left and one looked right. You know, that's what yeah. the eyes looked like. And uh, I I said when I gave him, I said, anytime I wanted to hide from Marty Feldman, I put the tip of my nose against his, and he never saw me. <laughs> he, he missed me. You know. Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, and now, 20th Century Fox presents the greatest comedy event of the 20th century, Mel Brooks' silent movie. Starring Mel Brooks, Marty Feldman, Dom DeLuise, Sid Caesar. Bernadette Peters. And a few surprises. Burt Reynolds. James Kahn. Liza Minnelli. Ann Bancroft. Paul Newman. Well, and then and then and then the, the and then the perversity to make a silent comedy after that. <laughs> I know. And that was that had a lot of stars. That had a bunch of stars. It's true. And that had Burt Reynolds and I mean, it had Anne Bancroft and. But, but it was still a silent movie. Paul you know? Newman. <laughs> I mean, you know, big stars. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Uh, I remember I got to be good friends with Burt Burt Reynolds, and it, there was a. Of a, a kind of a pole or something or 
they, I don't know, in the industry, they always said, you know, number one star, number two star, number, and uh, it turned out I had done, I don't know why I got it. I, I'd suddenly become famous, maybe the Johnny Carson thing, maybe, who knew? Anyway, when I finished, uh, I finished Silent Movie, I was number five as a movie star in the country. And, and Burt Reynolds was number six. So I would call him every night and say, hello, six, this is number five on the way. <laughs> and, you know, and I'd, and I'd just put him down. Like, you think you're a big star? I'm, I'm one big number ahead of you, you know. Right. Uh, so it was funny, you know. But Silent Movie got its money back in spades. It was a good movie, but it made yep. you know, it was crazy. And it, and it was also Mel Brooks different. Mel Brooks crazy. Working with Dom and with Marty and all those people, you know, Paul Dillon was a was a doll, and everybody, everybody, Liza Minnelli, everybody, you know, Jimmy Kahn. It was so much fun to do that movie. It was just fun. I mean, I, I it wasn't the Twelve Chairs. I had, I didn't want to say anything about the, the nature of of humanity. You know, I just said this is just silliness and fun. It's a, yes. it's like I'm taking a break from from heavy movie making. You know, it was it was funny after after I had um, I had rewatched Twelve Chairs last night. I watched it on YouTube. So usually when the movie ends, you know, they'll come up with other videos that remind you of. You know, here's some other Mel Brooks things. And one of them, which was hilarious, was a 1975 appearance he did on Johnny Carson. Uh, and now I want to know if this is the first time, because this is my, one of my favorite lines here is, you said, I'd love to be taller, but I don't want to go through the expense. <laughs> I did. I remember saying that. I, Was that the premiere of that line, though, on that show? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. I love Johnny Carson. Because... He was the only real nighttime, I guess, host that really listened and enjoyed the comedian, the people. And, and often I would do things like I did. I did an Indian ichthyologist about an Indian fish expert, and he just left it. He left it. He just left. He fell down. He was not there. I mean, you just. <laughs> He was under the desk, and you just could hear him holding his belly and screaming. I said, the, jar, the shark is a good person. The shark really never, never does him want trouble. But if he rings your bell, don't let him in your apartment. You know, he just, he just <laughs> went, Indian ichthyologist, he just went and you know. You do um, all kinds of, I won't say nothing anymore. No, not nothing. Strange, not. intriguing. Laugh riot. L -L 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 laugh riot. Dash riot. You're a caution. That's what it is, a caution. Remember when he said, oh, he's a caution. Uh, he plays an Indian ichthyologist, uh, uh, not your normal run-of-the-mill uh, character that you get. I didn't know I was going to do that tonight. I've got to get my brain set for the Indian ichthyologist. Okay, Indian ichthyologist. <clears throat> Indian ichthyologist. All right, Charlie, don't get scared. We're not jumping on. <laughs> the shark. Tonight we talk on the shark. The shark, contrary to popular belief, will never harm you. The shark is a benign creature of the deep. Of course, if you do thresh about in the water, you will attract the shark's attention, and he might get nervous. Also, if you're bleeding in the water, if you cut yourself or you wear shiny objects, you do make the shark nervous. Sometimes the shark will kill you for fun. <laughs> Quite often, the shark will follow you out of the water up on your beach blanket <laughs> and eat your beach ball. <laughs> One time, a shark followed my brother Irving home on the Brighton local. <laughs> rang, he rang the doorbell. My brother admitted him to the apartment, whereupon he ate my brother's family and a very expensive hat in the closet. 
But for all intents and purposes, the shark, and dorsal fin and all, will not annoy you or rub you the wrong way if you do not go in the water. If you live in Kansas, he won't bother you. He, he, gives, he gave the, the guests so much time. It's such a different kind of show than, than, than a, a talk show. I think your, your segment is well over half an hour on that show. Oh, yeah. Uh, I had so much fun. I loved him. I mean, he. And then during the uh, during the commercials, which went on for five minutes, I mean, before we got back, uh, he had drumsticks. He 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 played something on, and I played the desk. And we, we, <laughs> we rounds. I would do bump it a little, little, little lump, and he would do a little, 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 and we would just do. We both were were drummers, really, and you know, and he loved that. He loved that. He just loved playing drums. Yeah. He, he had a sort a, of a sweetest guy. He he had a sort of a reputation though as a cold guy off stage. Did you ever see any of that? I I didn't see much of it. I heard that too. That he, uh, but he used to. I'll tell you. He used to come. After I did the show, he would always come to my dressing room while I was changing and stuff to get back to my, you know, to, to leave. And he was always hanging out like like a fan, a real fan, instead of being such a the big star that he was, you know. Yeah. So I, I, I really loved him, you know. And I heard that he could be uh, cold or whatever off stage, you know. I think, you know, you don't have to take my, take my advice. Just do whatever the hell do you think, because you're going to have to live with it forever. And, and maybe the artist in residence uh, uh, resonates with you very much, you know, and that's important. I call well, it, you know, there's I made a, there's one mistake. A... I only made one mistake in titles in my whole life. Every one of my titles has been sensational. Blazing Saddles yeah. is an incredible t- title. Yeah. Incredible, you know, Young Frankenstein. Incredible the word Frankenstein. I mean, I mean, I uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It. Good title, you know. Made got some money back on the title. I think um, I did make one big mistake. That I loved the title because it talked about what was happening in America with uh, with the homeless, and I called it. I I called it uh, life stinks. No one, no one in their right mind. We got to we got to go to a movie called Life Stinks. Why would I? Why would the hell would I want to see? It was, it was so stupid, you know. Mm. I re- look back. I said, of course it. Didn't. It's a good movie. Didn't make a nickel. Yeah. Because you have another life title. Stinks. You would have called it. Well, I would have. I would have changed that. You know. I would have said I would have said life is beautiful, mm. and I would have made a fortune. <laughs> just the way that that, that stu- stupid Italian, you know, got away with yeah. something. He made a he made a I made a beautiful movie. He made a picture about death camps, and he made more money than I made. You know, yeah, <laughs> life is because beautiful. of the title. He said life is beautiful. I said life stinks. Yet it never pay in. The, it, this is show business. Don't be honest in show business. Only be honest in the work, never in the title. Just say the best movie ever, you know. <laughs> and, you know just say something and we'll bring him in, you know. Well, this has been great, Mel. I love hearing your voice. Well, this is supposed to be, you know, you, you conned me into saying it'll be a half hour, you know, it won't cost you much time. I, you know what I did? I yesed you. You, you said uh, half forty-five minutes. I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I gave you a good yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why did you say you know, forty? What, what did I say? Forty? Yeah. What is this? I said something about forty-five minutes. Yeah, you, you said I can give you. Uh, no, I think you said thirty-eight minutes. You said something yeah. funny. I give uh, yeah. thirty-eight minutes, and uh, yeah, I said, yeah, 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 that's fine. Thirty-eight's fine. Yeah, and we got two hours. Anyway, cut it into sections and serve it. I will. Indigestible bits. (laughs) 
If you enjoyed listening to Movies Till Dawn, you can visit my blog where I post videos related to the subjects that I interview. Just go to moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. You can find this podcast at moviestilldawnpodcast.com, but we're also available on most of your favorite podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube. I would love to hear from you. If you're inspired to reach out, you can email me at moviestilldawnpodcast at gmail.com. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. And if you have a film geek in your life, or even just a mildly curious fan, spread the word that we're here. Thank you.